Leading today's panel on tactics and strategies for generating pre-pub buzz is Christina Radke. Christina Radke is the International Account Director at NetGalley, a service that helps books succeed thanks to a powerful and growing community of book advocates. Over 300 publishers and hundreds of indie authors worldwide are using NetGalley to generate early buzz about their books. Previously, Christina worked on the marketing team at Harper Teen. I have the pleasure of introducing our panel. I'm really here just to help coordinate and click through the slides. So um, these are the folks that you're going to be listening to today. Each member of this panel is going to share a case study about a particular uh, title or strategy for reaching specific types of influencers. We took care to include a variety of books and different types of goals from standalone titles to series, from debut and established authors, large budgets and small. So I hope you'll each discover some new ideas that are relevant to the books that you are working on. Um, so let's go ahead and introduce each panelist. Heidi Sander is the founder and creative director of DigiWriting, book marketing agency, hashtag CanLitPit, and the Stratford Writers Festival. She also offers private consultations to authors, publishers, and literary festival and event organizers. Heidi's extensive literary background is deeply entrenched in writing, both as an author and journalist, and the founder of Blue Moon Publishers. This might be helpful for you guys as well. Um, Michelle Melsky is a publicist at Dundurn Press, a leading independent publisher offering Canadian books from every corner of the country. She's always on the lookout for ways to streamline the publicity process and has worked in marketing and publicity at Second Story Press, ECW Press, and Fitzhenry and Whiteside Publishers. Bryn Collier is the project manager and digital specialist at Harlequin Teen, a boutique young adult publishing program. As a self-confessed book nerd, she gets a thrill in using her 10 years of entertainment industry marketing experience to make books spark to life online and off. Lisa Marie Smith is the digital project manager at James Lorimer & Company in Toronto, where she's responsible for several new web-based initiatives, metadata creation and dissemination, and digital marketing. Previously, she worked as digital content manager at the University of Ottawa Press. Lisa started out in digital publishing as an intern on the PubOps team at Kobo. So um, 10 minutes each is not a lot of time to cover an entire marketing campaign. So we're going to jump right into it with Heidi. And here. And oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. OK. Oh, there are many of them. They're off. The covers are not upside down or anything, which I was sort of worried about. But, but. Oh. So this is Legend of Rhyme series author Jamie Lee Mann, opening her book for the very first time. She was able to share an intimate personal connection from her home in PEI with her fans across North America. Since 2014, we have helped shape the Legend of Rhyme series with Jamie. She's now an Amazon best-selling author, and we are launching her fifth book in the series this fall. She's been interviewed by Karen Mayer on CBC radio show. She's a coveted top five author in Atlantic Books today. And she's been endorsed by Order of Canada winner and Franklin the Turtle author, Paulette Bourgeois. But this three-year journey started from Jamie being an unknown author. It took a lot of work and employed some key strategies. So the focus of this case study today is how to market a series and an unknown author on a limited budget. So before I go into details, can I get a show of hands? How many audience members are independent authors? And small to medium-sized publishers? And the big five? OK, thanks. So Jamie wrote her middle grade fantasy series to appeal to boys and girls alike, and especially to resonate with reluctant readers. Through her character's adventures in a faraway realm, Twins Ariana and Asher, Asher meet a unicorn with a shocking secret, 
which is both good and bad, and even a girl from our time with a brilliant destiny. It's a great story, but in today's crowded marketplace, how do you actually create a successful pre-launch buzz? We start a minimum of six months in advance. And there are many elements of a marketing campaign, but within the short time frame we have today, I'm going to zero in on three main elements. Building a digital author platform, securing advance reviews, and turning traditional into digital. So I have some examples of Jamie's Instagram and Facebook channels. It's vital to build a digital author platform. It enables authors to connect directly with readers, to build followers, test marketing strategies. Jamie was active on social media, but there were some channels that she wasn't on, such as Pinterest and Goodreads. So in anticipation of her launch, we started crafting those channels. Note that even with video components, Jamie could do these mostly from her phone or from her computer. So it's nothing fancy and can be done on a minimal budget. To start with, we use Jamie's hub as her website as a hub for all the social media activity. So fans would find book news, blog posts, appearances, but we wanted to give them a reason to return. So we created a coloring book digital download, which was promoted on social media and in all of her face-to-face -face appearances, and it was to drive traffic back to her website. Later, we created a coloring contest based on the book. This was cross-promoted via social media. It gave fans a way to stay engaged in between her various book installments, and it repurposed content that already existed. Which brings me to graphics. No matter what social media platform you're on, graphics are key. They lead to wider reach and more shares. So we develop branded graphics that tie the entire book series together, from the covers to the frog icon to the bookmarks that you see there. I chose Instagram images here to show how the branding connects each book in the series. We size graphics separately for Twitter to have one cohesive look. Often for new book, resources are limited. So it's important to know your best social media platform. While Jamie is on all social media channels, Instagram is where her target market is mostly active and she regularly engages with her fans there. We ran a successful Instagram photo hashtag contest and then this teaser before the cover reveal. We released sections of the book cover over a few weeks so they could be pieced together like a puzzle. Now there are also opportunities to be involved in social media platforms even without your own following there. For example, we arranged a successful Reddit AMA Ask Me Anything event where Jamie discussed her writing in books with the Reddit book community members. It opened her up to a new fan base, and the best thing about it, it's free. So I want to touch upon one final social media platform, which is Goodreads. It's often overlooked, and it's the social media channel that is specifically for authors and readers. Most members, there post books they've read, that they are reading, and that they want to read. They can follow and friend each other, and they also form book clubs. And Goodreads is growing in staggering numbers. It's 60 million accounts globally. They have 20,000 book clubs, very genre specific, some of them. And they have over 30,000 daily reviews posted. So we've been successful with Jamie on Goodreads. We arranged feature author discussions with particular groups that connected with her genre where she'd do Q and A's. And we also held giveaways for each, each book she released. So, She's been featured 900 Goodreads lists and on two, um, and about the same to read shelves. And her books have received over 150 ratings on Goodreads, all four star status. So many clients don't want another social media channel to manage. Does that sound familiar to anyone? If that's you, here are the simple things to do on Goodreads. Create an author page, switch on the ask the author and answer questions, connect with some book clubs that suit your genre, and then create a book giveaway. They really help drive early reviews, they get your book placed on want to read shelves, and most importantly, they can create a story in the Goodreads newsfeed, and that really increases book discovery. Now, here we have advanced reviews from early adopters of Jamie's books. These were young children that she first read to in a PEI classroom. We actually used this in the media kit with real success. 
But we know that reviews from bona fide and credible sources do carry more clout. So in Jamie's case, we supplement our own internal list with NetGalley's 350,000 plus registered members. And this is to reach specific middle grade reviewers, teachers, librarians, and booksellers. All of Jamie's books appear on NetGalley before their release, and we use this to generate advanced praise, early reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, and to also secure blog coverage and other outlets. Here are a few tips for marketing series on NetGalley. We always archive the backlist titles. So when we have a reviewer new to Legend of Rhyme, we point them to all the previous books. So that increases the reach. It also leads to social shares, the number in the red box there. With each subsequent book, you have more committed reviewers and they share it more. I also want to emphasize how important it is to share your reviews on social media. We build relationships over time that way. So we're at the point now when Jamie's new book releases, we just reach out to our stable of past reviewers. They're thrilled that there's a new book out. They read it quite quickly and post their review. And it's also important to thank reviewers. It seems simple, but it's often overlooked. In total, we've received nearly 5,000 impressions, 500 downloads, and 200 reviews for Jamie's books on NetGalley. And while these numbers are impressive, you can't just expect to drop a book up there and have amazing results. You have to follow best practices. So upload a media kit, a detailed marketing plan, follow up with reviewers, and build those relationships over time. It's a lot of work, but it's worth the results. Now, this list on the screen shows featured targeted media that we've secured for Jamie's books. So Atlantic Books Today, The Guardian, Arts East, radio shows, etc. We also range coverage for Jamie on, main, on a lot of online blogs. But while Jamie was featured on CBC with the launch of her first book, media interest grew with the series, and that's supported by the online coverage. For example, a year later, we had Jamie featured in the high-profile Middle Shelf magazine. So it is something you need to grow and build relationships on. I can't emphasize that enough. <clears throat> This particular slide shows social media engagement from a bookstore appearance. 68 likes are more than the number of people who actually came to Jamie's book table during, you know, during the time that she was in the store. <clears throat> so while we created a strong presence for Jamie as an island author, digital media can extend the reach of face-to-face -face traditional marketing. So don't forget to turn traditional marketing into digital messaging at the same time. At this bookstore appearance, for example, bookmarks were designed to encourage Instagram interaction. So the text read, want to hear from Jamie Lee Mann? Use hashtag LOR series on Instagram and upload an image of the book to show where you're reading. Bookmark is a PEI landmark, and we have established repeat appearances in the bookstore so that Jamie is a household name now, and they give her a lot of social media attention. In fact, we often schedule appearance at school before she appears in the bookstore because interested students drag their parents there along with their open wallets and it's good for everyone. We've had four book launches for Jamie's books in schools, in bookstores, at the iconic Prince Edward Island Preserve. But the key element of all of her events are that she has crafts, coloring, posters and engaging giveaways for her particular audience. All events receive social media attention before and after. Here are further examples of events announced ahead of time via social media. <clears throat> Reading Town Canada event in Charlottetown that we had set up for her, and Word on the Street Halifax, which was part of an Atlantic tour that we arranged for Jamie. And we're bringing it back home in full circle now. I had mentioned the Bookmark bookstore earlier. On Canadian Authors for Indies Day, we arranged for Jamie to appear at the Bookmark along with other island authors. In turn, Bookmark made a video where Jamie was featured. It's been shared on social media and her audience continues to grow. So in closing, a few wrap-up tips. Digital author platform. If you don't have the time, create a content calendar so that you have an engagement framework. Post it to a social media management system like Hootsuite. It's fast. 
Advance reviews always thank your reviewers. Turning traditional into digital, monitor the feed of your favorite bookseller or library and share their news. In turn, when it's your time, they'll share yours. Thanks. So I'll be talking about Five Roses by Alice Zorn. So this is literary fiction by an emerging Canlit author. Alice Zorn is the author of Arrhythmia and a book of short fiction, Ruins and Relics, which was a finalist for the 2009 Quebec Writers' Federation First Book Prize. She has twice placed first in Prairie Fire's fiction contest, and she lives in Montreal. So when Alice came to Dundurn, we felt like she was just on the edge of breaking out as a formidable Canlit author. Um, her novel, Five Roses, is a novel about overcoming the emotional fallout of a shattering loss. It shows the intertwining lives of three women in Montreal's Point St. Charles, where a backdrop of gentrification mirrors the traumas that haunt these women. The publication date for the book was in the summer, so we already knew that it was important to get some pre-publication buzz, um, since a summer pub date can be difficult, especially when it's literary fiction and people are often looking for beach reads at that time. Um, so in the next slide, um, I talk about endorsements. So the first part of the marketing plan for us is always endorsements. Um, and these are especially important for a novel um, because it adds credibility to the novel ahead of time. Um, Alice Thorne was not a household name yet, uh, so it was really important to have other established Canlit authors blurb her book. Positioning Zorn as a contemporary of these female Canlit authors was a great way to, to appeal to their audiences. And the endorsement process at Dundurn starts about at least six months ahead of publication date, sometimes earlier. So it's important to leave enough time for these authors to read and review the book and to get their endorsements into you, um, you know, with enough time so that they can get it onto the book jacket. Um, next slide. So, um, as I said, we were going for a very literary Canlit vibe for this book. Uh, so the next step was to identify the key influencers in that area. So I was looking for people who were already actively championing books online and who were followed by people who wanted to know more about Canlit. So obviously, Carrie Claire came to mind. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Carrie manages 49th Shelf, which is dedicated solely to Canadian books. And her blog, Pickle Me This, features reviews of the Canadian books that she loves. Uh, so this is an Instagram that we regrammed of Carrie reading the arc of Five Roses uh, while eating breakfast. So if anyone follows her, you know she often has these breakfast reading Instagrams. Um, so with this post, Five Roses was seen by a curated list of Canlit readers. Uh, Carrie really got behind Five Roses. She was tweeting and talking about it on many occasions. The beauty of key influencers is that they're active on many platforms. So if they love your book, they talk it up on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, their website, their blog, um, anything that they're on. Um, so in the next slide, you can see that if you're lucky, they'll talk about it on the radio. Uh, so here's Carrie tweeting about her interview on CBC Radio's Ontario Morning. Um, so at Dundurn, we have a running list of key influencers um, that are in the different areas that we publish. And we send them seasonal care packages of titles that we think that they would be interested in. It's a way of staying on their radar throughout the year. And we often include extra book-related goodies in the packages, such as like candy or tea or uh, bookmarks. And in the next slide, you'll see what we made for Five Roses. Um, it was a postcard that had a recipe for cream puffs. And so the author, Alice Soren, created this recipe herself. And Five Roses features a subplot of two of the women opening up their own French patisserie. So it was really on theme for the novel. And we sent these postcards out with the media mailing and packages for influencers and bloggers. And Alice handed them out at her events. And then the next one shows my cream puffs. <laughs> so I made these, and you know, not to brag too much, but I did win the company baking competition. So <laughs> it's a very good recipe. Uh, so the fun thing with these postcards is that it added an extra thing for people to talk about online. So even though they were physical, they translated um, to digital. Uh, bloggers that receive review copies would tweet out the card, and a lot of them would tweet out pictures of their own cream puffs that they made. Um, which they may not have done if we had just simply sent them a review copy and a press release. Um, the next slide um, shows our NetGalley feedback page. So we put up Five Roses on NetGalley for three months, um, which is not typical for us. We usually do one to two months. Um, and we put it up there four months ahead of its publication date. 
And our main goal on NetGalley for Five Roses was consumer reviews, so especially Goodreads reviews. Um, NetGalley has over 350,000 book advocates, and 60% of those are reviewers and early consumer influencers. So those were exactly the type of people that we wanted to reach, which is why we left it up there for three months so that we could really get their attention. Uh, for literary fiction, Goodreads reviews are especially important. It's similar to the endorsements where they add credibility to the novel ahead of time. Um, and as you can see here, we had over 1,200 impressions, 179 people clicked to read, and we had 21 reviews um, submitted through NetGalley itself. Um, next slide. Um, but it's not enough to just put your title up on NetGalley and hope it gets reviews. Um, you also have to actively encourage people to request that book on NetGalley. So we schedule title-specific tweets um, for all of our NetGalley titles, and we send the list of titles out to our newsletters, to librarians, and to consumers. Um, and tagging NetGalley in your tweets almost always results in a retweet, uh, so it's a really great way to help get your title in front of more <coughs> NetGalley users. Um, then we did a blog tour for Five Roses, and a blog tour for literary fiction is not that common. It's usually for young adult novels or genre fiction titles, um, but this was actually an author request. She really wanted a blog tour, and um, it turned out to be a great way to get literary bloggers to review the book. We offered excerpts, author interviews, giveaway copies, and we made this custom blog tour banner. Um, and this tour ran the week of publication, which meant that I had to do all of the outreach um, months in advance, and we had to order enough ARC so that these bloggers could read it ahead of time. So at the beginning stages um, of every marketing plan at Dundurn, we identify the publicity assets for a book. So these are the hooks that the media would find interesting, and we use these assets to inform the media that we're targeting. So the two biggest publicity assets for Five Roses are the author, Alice Soren, and the Montreal setting. Uh, so many reviewers of the book wrote that reading the book was like taking a literary walking tour through Montreal. And um, obviously the author lives in Montreal, so it was a key asset for us. So we created this map of Montreal, and it features the key places um, and that the characters go in Five Roses. And so we included this in all of our media mailings to really hammer home that this is a book that <coughs> celebrates its Montreal setting. Um, so the next slide shows um, the key media that we were targeting. Um, so we were looking for media that would reach people living in Montreal and also people interested in the Montreal literary scene. And so we sent them everything, the postcard, the map, email pitches, physical mail, anything we could, because um, we really wanted to get that Montreal media behind the book. And the next slide, you'll see that it worked. Uh, so this is a review by Ian McGillis in the Gazette. And then the next slide shows Montreal Review of Books. They gave Five Roses a beautiful review, and they featured a two-page spread with an interview and a picture with her. Um, and Five Roses was also featured in Mesa Neuve after months and months of follow-up. And Alice was interviewed on CBC Montreal's Home Run. And the key factor in reaching these targets was advanced outreach. So months ahead of publication date, making sure they know that this book is out there. Um, so these are long lead publications, so typically four to six months ahead of time. Uh, but once your target media knows about the book, um, it can translate into some pretty cool like extra coverage. So this is a tweet um, by Alice when she was at the Montreal Review of Books 50th issue launch party. So they asked her to come and do a reading of Five Roses. And then one more way we reached out to the Montreal audience uh, was through bookstores. So we sent Alice to the Montreal Book Fair, so that's where the, the sales reps and the booksellers, they mingle and they talk about books. And um, we sent Alice to talk about Five Roses ahead of the publication date. So sometimes it just takes that personal connection for a bookseller to hand sell a title. So sending your authors directly to meet the booksellers is a really great way to forge that connection. Um, so all of a sudden, Five Roses was the Montreal book for the summer. Uh, this is a screenshot of 49th Shelf, where Alice Soren wrote a guest blog post about her favorite books about Montreal. So to wrap up, uh, a targeted plan is always best. So identify the publicity assets of your book and match those assets with your target market. Find the influencers in those market and just get your book in their hands. 
consumer reviews are always important to build pre-publication buzz and also to create a sense of credibility. And use social media to repurpose the coverage you receive and to drive reviewers to the book on NetGalley and do as much early outreach as you can so that lots of stuff ha happens around the publication date. Hi everybody, I am Bryn Collier and I have the distinct pleasure of walking you through some of the key tactics we went, uh, we ran to promote Lifeblood, um, which is the follow-up to the instant New York Times bestseller, First Life. Um, this is a action-packed, keep you on the edge of your seat YA novel um, that I had just so much fun and I'm really excited to share it with all of you guys. So on the first slide, or next slide, um, I'm, here are a couple of the different goals that we had set out when we were starting to launch this campaign. So one thing to mention is that Gina is a bit of a unique author for us because she publishes both adult editorial and young adult editorial. So we had to take a bit of a different approach uh, when tackling this campaign. So you'll see we did have the traditional sales target, so getting on the NYT, um, also increasing her overall sales, but also really bridging um, the gap between adult and young adult editorial, transitioning some of her readers down, and activating her existing readers. So how did we do this? On the next slide, or this slide, um, these are the four key pillars that we really focused on in the pre-order um, section of the campaign. So um, building consumer buzz, engaging adult crossover readers, um, creating trade awareness, and targeted advertising are some of the things that really helped us set up what I'm happy to say was a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> um, okay, so first off, how did we build consumer buzz? So one thing that we did before anything was really focusing on key influencers. And that was trade, but it was also social media influencers. So to get people talking, we identified our targets and then went out to all of the different influencers with early release galleys, with um, exclusive content, with um, galley copies for them to give away on their platforms, to really take these influencers and kick them up a notch and turn them into our own little activists. Um, in addition, we also ran our own galley giveaways, which meant that we were creating organic read, um, reader reviews in, in addition to these influencer outreach reviews at a very early stage. Um, this resulted in higher Goodreads rankings, a lot earlier reviews, and a lot more social chatter. And we found that overall this was an incredibly effective but also cost-effective way to great, uh, create consumer buzz. So then, now we got everybody talking about it, we took to the streets and um, shifted our focus to the masses and to mass sampling. So we partnered um, with several different festivals that focused either on YA or general readers, um, as well as teen entertainment events with um, some of our media partners like Girls Life. And what we did is we really focused on getting the book out there, getting just enough content um, so that people could fall in love with the book and pre-order, but not so much that we were supplementing their reading. And we also took this as an opportunity to take real world qualified great connections and take them online. So we created highly Instagrammable content. Um, if you see, I've got little book lollipops there. They were very popular on Instagram. Um, we also uh, gift wrapped a bunch of books and did a couple different activations. And what we saw is that a lot of people were taking pictures of our different events and posting them and tagging them or tagging us online. And then what we did is we rewarded people for doing these activations. So if you wanted a book, if you wanted to participate, you had to give us something. Um, and so what was great about this is we were able to take what was traditionally um, a, an offline event online so that we had a way to continue the conversation way after the tents came down. Um, so next up, now that we've got the influencers talking, we've got people that have sampled the book, what are they gonna find when they hit our socials? So we wanted to have a really strong branded message for Lifeblood across all of our social media. Um, and you'll see here that we really went for a blend of images. So we did a mix of lifestyle images like that really pretty copy of the book with some really cool succulents because millennials love succulents. Um, <laughs> as well as a book or a cake which believe it or not someone in our office made um, 
which is crazy. You can't see. There's like a little, the cover actually is tilting on the top. There's crystals. It's insane. Um, as well as excerpt reveals and um, quotes and endorsements. So basically we wanted to make sure that Gina's fans, when they were coming to our socials or her socials, they found content that they like desperately wanted to share so that they wanted to become that social media activist that we were so desperately looking for. Um, and because of that, we saw incredible, incredible numbers um, for all of this content, which I don't know if you can see it because it's pretty big, but we, we definitely were high triple digits in a lot of our posts. Um, so then next, to really take that idea further, we wanted to empower Gina's existing fans um, to really take up arms and champion the release of this book. So what we did is we offered all of her fans the opportunity to sign up via digital form um, to become an influencer and take part in a release week blitz. And then once we had that, we had over 300 people sign up to take part. We mailed out bookmarks and signed book plates to all of those people and then they went on the week of release and stuffed all the books with signed book plates and bookmarks and put stickers on the front and took photos and posted to their Instagrams and to their Facebooks and to their Twitters. And basically it became an onslaught of Gina madness, um, which was fantastic. But what's most important here is that Gina went and val like, gave validation to every single person. And I'm not kidding, this girl has been busy. Um, she reposted, retweeted, re-Facebooked, re-Instagrammed every single post that someone did so that everybody felt like they went out and they did it and then they were appreciated, which was crucial. It's also free. All it takes is the time and it goes so far. Because of that, we've seen people continue. We're weeks after release. People are still going out. They're still stuffing books. But there's also people that are going into stores and sending us photos because they've seen the books because they're they're out there and oh my god I saw it too and there's only three left now so we're getting updates um, and what's great is that this was also North American wide so this was Canadian it was also um, in the states so you know there really wasn't any barriers here um, so then um, we wanted to focus again, as I mentioned, on engaging her adult crossover audience, which is a tricky thing when you're trying to bring somebody from an adult editorial down to um, a young adult editorial. And because Gina has such a well-established fan base, and this series really does um, read up incredibly well, and we've seen great um, crossover audience in her previous series with us, we wanted to really create that awareness. And what we heavily leveraged was her existing platforms um, so when I spoke to Gina, we came up with a strategy of how to create more engagement, more conversation, um, rather than just speaking out to people. Um, we also use social media advertising as a cost-effective way to target adult readers um, of her content and also similar editorial that would also read down well. And then to increase the layers in the adult market um, at a relatively cost-effective way, we had... Um, our PR team reached out to media that supported her adult editorial. Um, so we really had a multi-phase effect there. And then to create trade awareness, um, because now we've got the consumer side well covered at the same time we were building up her brand recognition within the trade. Um, because a lot of people are still used to on the consumer and the trade side as Gina as an adult author. So really trying to build her brand with um, within the channel. So focusing on building her brand, we did that through uh, multiple touch points, whether that was having her attend trade events, um, whether that was different mailings, whether that was um, digital or physical ad or traditional advertising in trade publications. Um, we had multiple touch points in place for this title. But a key component to all of these tactics was that we were really pushing early reads and we were doing this a lot earlier. So we were giving out galleys or we were pushing to net galley for e-galley downloads. Um, and one thing that we did uh, new this time that we found incredibly successful was to promote and feature the title on net galley, which meant that we got beyond our regular network that we would send a lock widget out to, but also got and were able to identify new and key qualified readers and booksellers. 
Um, and then finally, targeted advertising. Um, so leading up to release and well beyond, we ran a variety of digital ads for the title, um, blending programmatic, direct, and social media advertising. And what we find is that digital advertising really gives you the ability to precisely target um, your audience. And so blending these three different tactics really helped us reach qualified readers across a multitude of platforms. Um, and the great thing is with the um, self-service social media advertising, you can really scale this type of um, program up or down um, depending on budget without losing the ability to target relevant readers, um, which is something that I personally love about digital media. So that's kind of lifeblood in a nutshell. I'm with Lorimer Children and Teens, um, and I handle all of the digital marketing. And rather than focusing on a specific book's um, pre-pub campaign like some of the other panelists did, I'm going to focus more on why pre-pub activities are important for us across all of our titles at the beginning of a season, um, and how we use that pre-pub activity um, and why it's so valuable to us. So we publish books for struggling and reluctant readers. So already we're identifying a huge problem. We're trying to sell books to people who don't want to read. So how do we deal with that? The solution is to target their parents, teachers, and librarians, and then we let them handle putting the books in children's hands. Um, in all seriousness, we really do have a mandate of getting all kids reading, no matter what their reading uh, levels are. Um, so you can see some of the things that we focus on in all of our books. Realistic storylines, high interest level, but low reading levels so that we're giving age-appropriate content to kids at the reading level that they, they can manage. Easy accessible vocabulary, diverse characters, and featuring Canadian authors and Canadian settings. We know that these are things that teachers and librarians are looking for, so how do we identify the teacher and librarian market, how do we reach them, and how do we generate a buzz with those people? And when we do, what do we do with their feedback? So at first, uh, just a little tiny bit about metadata. Um, even in pre-pub stages, metadata is so important to generate the best possible response for your book. Um, we found recently that product descriptions for the teacher and librarian market are so important and it's not necessarily the kind of description that you would put in the hands of an end reader. Um, so we really try and cater our product metadata in pre-pub stages, especially when we're putting ARCs in reviewers' hands and teacher and librarians' hands um, because we want them to focus on the things that we feel are the most important um, to highlight in pre-pub stages. So some of our pre-pub audience building activities um, where we're trying to target these teachers and librarians start out with uh, webinars. We participate in webinars um, where teachers and librarians are already subscribers. So this is using things like um, school library journal, book list, and library resource group who already have a huge following of teachers and librarians who we can rely on to generate um, reliable responses to our books. This is an example of a summer webcast that we did for our fall 2016 books in the US, and the focus of this webinar was reluctant readers. So really, we knew that we were gonna be targeting the kind of people we want um, reviewing our books. We give a little preview in these webinars of the upcoming season. We also link them to NetGalley um, and pre-approve attendees on this list um, to put up, uh, to download our NetGalley uh, ARCs and also review our books. We also do some more traditional um, pre-pub advertising as well in online and print media. Um, we find that the digital advertising is so much more useful for us be because we can actually get in contact with the people who are interacting with these ads and add them to our pre-existing uh, marketing lists and target them for future books that we think that they might be interested in. <coughs> we also participate in list rentals and third-party e-blasts. Again, that's tapping into audiences that are already established um, in communities that we know we're going to be reaching key influencers for our books. 
Um, we participate in the email um, marketing activities that NetGalley offers to us, and we always see a huge spike in activity on uh, those titles that we have up on NetGalley, and we always generate way more reviews when we do this kind of activity. We also do in-person pre-pub um, activities as well at trade shows like uh, American Library Association. Uh, this month I will be attending um, TLA as well. And so we're talking to these people in person, learning the kinds of things that are important to us so that we know how to target them and how to get our books in their hands. And uh, just a little bit about um, some examples that we do on NetGalley. Um, we do put up our Canadian releases and our US releases on NetGalley but we have a way larger audience uh, in the US community on NetGalley, so we definitely see a much higher response. This is a really interesting um, book to take a look at because if you go back to the first slide, um, you can see we're not getting very much activity on this particular book. It's a part of our series, um, Side Streets, and that's a YA series of high-low books about contemporary teen issues. Um, we didn't generate very many reviews. There's two there. They weren't really useful for generating a lot of buzz around the book before it went on sale, but a year later, we released the same book in the US, and when we put that up on NetGalley, you can see the huge leap in statistics that we got on our, our NetGalley feedback page there. We reached almost, we reached over 2,600 people um, and generated 85 reviews, most of which were really high quality reviews from teachers and librarians that we could use to market the book. And this book, it's the same book as the, the one that we put up a year ahead of time in Canada. We use the same book description, um, but if you wanna take a look at the previous slide again, look at the category there. Um, this is another reason why metadata and prepub stages is so important. So this book was categorized as children's fiction up on NetGalley when it first went up there, but when we released it in the US, we put it under teens and YA, which is actually more accurate. And um, it was really helpful in, in generating more accurate responses for that book, because we were targeting the teachers and librarians who were looking for YA content, which is what this book was. Go to the next. So when these pre-pub activities that we're participating in, it's not just about building buzz. We really want to be um, tapping into these audiences that we can add to our marketing lists and use them for future publications to generate reliable and honest feedback for our books. So as I mentioned, not just to build pre-pub buzz, it's really all about valuable, responsive contacts for us and reaching new audiences that we might not have had the opportunity to reach if we had not been participating in those, um, in those pre-pub activities. Um, and these people are the ones who are really selling our books. Um, so we really appreciate their feedback during pre-pub stages. Um, they help us identify the important aspects of the books that we can use to position our books in our traditional marketing activities as well and what's gonna be most effective to market the book. Um, so this is an example of our positive response. Um, this book we positioned in Canada. Um, it's about missing and murdered Aboriginal women. It's not as a hot button of a topic in the US, so we had to use NetGalley reviews um, to see what was resonating with people in the US, and that was more of the racism, sexism, and pol police discrimination angle. And this is an email where we took that approach, and you can see we had an open rate of over 50%, um, and that was really because of the pre-pub response that we generated uh, from NetGalley reviews. I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I noticed sort of running through each of their presentations that I think are worth um, mentioning. So things like making sure that you are using creative and shareable content when you're doing digital marketing, um, sharing your appreciation or having the author share their appreciation. This is like your mother telling you to send your thank you notes after your birthday. Like it's very, very valuable and it doesn't cost you anything. Use your data. I mean, this whole conference is all about data. Use it. Um, everybody was kind enough, uh, because I asked them to, to include NetGalley in their presentation. And things like you know, download rates, uh, feedback rates, et cetera, all of that 
can be at your fingertips to follow up with people, to thank them, to pitch them comp titles, et cetera. And then something that Lisa Marie said, which I think is super valuable, is keeping in mind who your pre-pub audience is and whether that's somebody that is different from your end reader. If your goal is to reach um, consumer reviewers, that's one thing. But if your goal is to reach librarians and teachers who will be pitching this book to their students or to their board who's going to talk about whether to bring it into the school, et cetera, that's a different audience. And so make sure that you're speaking to those people.